Um, I want to uh, focus on the relationship between architecture and digital. Uh, and I want to say, show this picture, a uh, picture of Lagos, uh, the city in Africa, where I went for the first time in 95. Um, and when I was going there, I was looking for issues of how this completely dysfunctional city uh, actually was uh, an element or prototype of self-organization. And I even kind of went there with the word algorithm kind of firmly in my mind, kind of looking how certain patterns uh, would be kind of visible uh, in this seemingly completely disorganized uh, kind of system. At that time, I had a kind of feeling that between architecture and the digital, there could be affinity and that we were looking at the same issues as, for instance, neuroscience, brain science, etc., etc. Now, 15 years later, it seems that the smart city is the outcome of the kind of digital engagement with architecture and urbanism. And if you see this diagram of the smart city, you see sensors, you don't see a kind of urban wildness, but you only see a kind of boring urban system which is controlled through digital means. So I think that something very important has happened, that the preoccupation of the digital kind of world has actually eroded uh, our sense of urban life. This is an urban picture of the 40s. You can be 100% sure that this person will have an adventure in the course of the next 12 hours. Uh, this is a kind of typical image uh, of today. And you can be very sure that nothing exciting will happen to this person even in the next 48 hours. Uh, and, uh, I th and I think that is a kind of very uh, important kind of shift. And uh, I, I believe that somehow uh, we need to understand why that has happened. Um, basically, in the last 20 years, we've also kind of been completely obsessed by looking at the city but uh, cities are only covering 2% of the world. And uh, simply to uh, run against that expectation, we started to look with my uh, office AMO and with my students at Harvard <coughs> at a project that we call the countryside. We simply wanted to look at the rest of the world and we wanted to understand how the rest of the world kind of functions. And in this presentation, I will kind of look and present the effect of the digital on the countryside. And because I believe that the countryside is an area where certain trends and certain possibilities, but also certain crises, are presented uh, in their clear and pure form before they manifest themselves in the city. Basically, every single kind of part of the world is currently uh, observed by increasingly sophisticated uh, devices uh, in higher and higher resolutions. And that, uh, given, is, has fundamentally uh, affected agriculture. It means for agriculture that no part of the world, world is unknown. And also that the composition of the kind of first let's say, meter of the world is known and that uh, it doesn't contain any kind of surprises, no matter how far uh, we are removed from that part. It means that the kind of tractor, the old uh, kind of symbol of uh, progress and uh, agriculture and uh, uh, human activity on the earth has become kind of more and more a kind of digital office. And that kind of basically what is happening is that in the tractor, uh, the farmer, and here you see a farmer behind his laptop, the farmer gives instructions how the tractor should behave and what the tractor should do. And therefore, the tractor is a kind of executing office that uh, benefits from this incredible knowledge and that kind of seeds only where necessary in the quantities that are specified. And therefore, uh, the digital has an enormous effect on kind of farming, removing all spontaneity, uh, removing also all the kind of farmer's knowledge, uh, all the um, farmer folklore, and simply in favor of a kind of huge efficiency. Uh, what we have as one of the consequences is that there is in kind of America now kind of running the central belt from Texas to Canada where the harvesting uh, of agriculture is 
uh, intensified to such an incredible uh, precision art with such kind of precision devices and kind of machineries that in this kind of area, more than 70% of all American agriculture is taking place in this territory. We, with Harvard, were able to plant kind of some of our students in this kind of process, uh, simply to see what is happening and how such a kind of armada, armada of a incredible machinery that is so expensive that in order to uh, be uh, affordable, needs to kind of work 24 hours a day. And so this machinery, this army, kind of moves from the south to the north in a kind of yearly, uh, uh, yearly process. So I would say that the digital kind of, and, and all these technologies are, over the last 10 years, uh, radically transforms the American landscape and that the kind of radicality of that uh, transformation is only kind of possible if you look at the countryside. Now, there's a kind of two very interesting further statistics. It turns out that this exact area is the part of America where the uh, subsidies are most lavishly kind of applied. Uh, and it is also the part of America where the large, largest percentage has kind of voted for Trump. And therefore, um, there, what I think we are uh, beginning to kind of explore and to reveal is what the intersection is between all these kind of transformations. The second uh, thing I want to kind of talk about is uh, a part of uh, the American West, uh, and particularly a kind of industrial park, which is called Tahoe Reno Industrial Park. It is just uh, across from Silicon Valley. And what I think we are kind of beginning to see here is how uh, each of the kind of digital technologies and digital kind of ideas that we are elaborating in uh, Silicon Valley has a kind of, and, and which uh, of course are very often about ideas and about different kind of ways of living, but how each of these has an incredible correlation or effect in terms of very intense and very large kind of physical entities. Um, and that therefore, and, and so I went to kind of look at this uh, landscape, uh, ostensibly it's a kind of very beautiful uh, virgin uh, territory, uh, extremely kind of appealing and, and, and beautiful, but in this uh, situation are now appearing a series of rectangles rectangles completely untouched by any architecture, uh, re rectangles kind of seemingly uh, unplanned in terms of their kind of configuration and uh, increasing uh, almost kind of every month in terms of size. And some of these buildings are of a really unimaginable size uh, of, for instance, two kilometers by uh, 800 meters. Um, I think that uh, it's for architects actually kind of really uh, difficult to see this kind of proliferation because an image like this one is kind of more beautiful and more intense than anything architecture has been kind of able to produce in the last uh, 20 years, uh, I would say. Uh, we are kind of dealing here with a kind of world which is largely uh, kind of mechanized, uh, robotized, and where human beings are actually a uh, very rare appearance uh, and where human beings are actually seen uh, partly as a kind of security threat uh, to be uh, dealt with uh, through, again, uh, mechanical devices and where the human is now uh, kind of almost a caricature of a kind of relaxation uh, position, uh, almost as far away uh, as possible from this uh, intense sparkling kind of newness. So in a way, humanism uh, kind of becomes the kind of strangely regressive condition. And I can only think that architecture is kind of really part of this and has no part of this. Uh, and, and some of this uh, further control, some of this control and this kind of artificiality uh, goes even further where certain, only certain parts of the spectrum of the light are exploited uh, in order to promote what these kind of boxes are uh, intended for. 
And this is kind of basically uh, 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 to create a kind of particular kind of vegetable. Uh, only a very s small section of the spectrum is exploited. And here again, I would say uh, there is a kind of um, definition of the sublime producing an overwhelming sense of awe or the high emotion through being vast or grand. And I think that that kind of uh, definition really applies to images like this. And as I said, uh, architects have not been kind of really good in creating kind of similarly strong equivalents. So the question I'm kind of really posing uh, to this uh, digital world is the kind of separation between architecture and the digital. Is it going to be definitive or is there uh, some kind of perspective of uh, a degree of uh, uh, integration. This is the current landscape. Uh, you are wondering whether, kind of, for instance, slight modifications could create a slightly greater interest. Uh, and you are also wondering if uh, with these kind of monumental changes, uh, perhaps architecture can also contribute to uh, introduce uh, elements that could articulate this world. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. And uh, there's so much to talk about this uh, relationship with the digital. But before that, I wanted to ask you to tell us a little bit more about uh, the connection to migration. Because when we spoke first about the countryside project, you kind of connected it very strongly also to another big topic of the current moment, migration. You said with the exodus to the city, villages are partly reanimated by new crowds. Uh, so I wanted to ask you to tell us a little bit about how, how it connects to that. Well, I, th I think that the uh, part of the countryside uh, project uh, is, of course, also looking at uh, Europe. Uh, we're doing that uh, with Nicholas Mark uh, of the Frankfurter Allgemeine. And uh, he has been kind of particularly uh, interested how in Germany, uh, with its extremely unequal population distribution and its kind of lingering uh, I don't want to say backwardness, but it, it lingering neglect of what used to be kind of East Germany, uh, whether uh, and how certain uh, of the current refugee streams are uh, guided toward uh, some of the most uh, depopulated uh, and uh, least activated uh, kind of sections of the countryside. And we have found uh, a number of uh, kind of situations that are very paradoxical, but where uh, perhaps the refugee crisis can also mean that certain sections uh, of territory, not only in Germany, but also, uh, for instance, in the north of the Netherlands, can be kind of reanimated uh, through these streams of refugees. Uh, and uh, therefore, what we're looking at is simply whether migration itself uh, should not always be you, uh, kind of considered as a kind of massive problem uh, to be resisted uh, by all means, but uh, can also be accommodated in uh, other and smarter policies. And whenever you do such a, a big project, and I think that connects very much to DLD and the amazing pool of knowledge kind of DLD creates, you bring together practitioners from all fields. And I attended one of these brainstormings in Amsterdam the other day, where for almost 12 hours there was a discussion about the countryside with experts from all fields. And another topic which kept coming up is, of course, climate change and the way uh, climate change connects to the countryside. Here is a quote from you. It's clear that the enormous effects of global warming, the magic of ice sheets and permafrost, increased desertification will manifest themselves mainly in the countryside, enabling and disabling parts of the world. And that brings us also to, to, uh, to Russia and the whole yeah. research you're doing there. Yeah, so, so I have to admit that um, in my obsession with the city, I, I really neglected the countryside uh, almost uh, systematically. And that therefore um, making uh, a transformation and a deliberate uh, change, and for instance, going to Siberia and, and the heartland uh, of the former Soviet Union, it was really and truly eye-opening. Um, for instance, uh, when communism still uh, was uh, active in Russia, 
Aeroflot, the national airline, covered 260 destinations in Russia. Under the market economy, that number was reduced to 60. So it meant that basically 20, 200 uh, cities in Russia were abandoned and kind of disconnected from the uh, network and basically condemned to kind of recede to the 19th century. And uh, so you have a kind of fascinating phenomena at, at this point where certain kind of sanctions of America are pushed into uh, whatever we think about it, but into a highly futuristic direction, while other kind of sections of the world, particularly in Russia, are kind of really pushed in the opposite direction. And if you then kind of imagine that, for instance, exactly those parts of Russia are also suffering from the kind of melting of permafrost, which actually literally uh, kind of changes the foundation or um, destroys the foundation of their whole civilization, from railways to buildings to uh, oil uh, uh, lines, then you see how unbelievably kind of radical uh, climate change is. And I was very happy that at some point I felt physically uh, what those consequences are. One other thing which is fascinating is that it kind of all began with uh, Switzerland. Um, and in a way, you know, for me, the Engadin, where actually your countryside project began, it's a kind of a long story because my parents always want, you know, I'm Swiss and so my parents would always go to the mountains to holidays and I didn't want to go to the mountains, so I had a kind of a rebellion against that. So it took me a long time to kind of reconcile with the mountains and now I go there a lot. It was mainly Gerhard Richter and you who encouraged me to go to the Engadin for very different reasons. And you started actually the countryside project in, in, uh, in Celerina. And it would be great to hear a little bit how uh, Celerina uh, of all places yeah, triggered yeah, yeah. this worldwide yeah. research. Uh, no? Basically, I was very lucky because my girlfriend's uh, parents had a house in Celerina. And so uh, f from maybe 1990, uh, I went there uh, every summer, in the beginning uh, innocently, uh, but uh, as time went along, I had to kind of really uh, discover uh, an incredible amount of changes. And uh, one of the weird changes was that the kind of city, uh, little city, became kind of smaller and smaller. The population became lower and lower. Uh, many houses in the center were abandoned, but yet the city grew. And so that was a phenomenon, deep population, but at the same time kind of physical extension. Uh, it turned out that kind of more and more uh, kind of farms were the, the first memory of it was uh, the smell of cow shit. And kind of basically after 10 years, I realized that there was simply no smell left in that uh, kind of whole village. Uh, and then I started to kind of really become alert and, and inquire and then discovered that kind of, for instance, uh, somebody who looked like a, a traditional farmer was in fact a dissatisfied nuclear scientist from Frankfurt who uh, uh, kind of gave up and, and then started to farm. Discovered that uh, kind of most of the population in the winter were uh, Thai uh, women kind of looking after dogs, houses, and kids. And so uh, uh, that really triggered the overall shift uh, of my attention to the country. So. And maybe before we open it up and can take uh two questions from, uh, from the floor. A last question to kind of connect to how you ended your presentation with um, the sort of idea of the gap or bridging the gap you know, between the digital um, and architecture. Um, there is a very interesting project of yours which uh, is from 2005 called Hedge Fund where you developed uh, an extraordinary toolbox basically for a digital office and I wanted to ask you to tell us a little bit about, because as you know I'm always interested in unrealized projects, to tell us a little bit about this Hedge Fund project Project, and then also about the project which will be realized, which somehow connects to that, which is your project uh, in Berlin for, for Springer, which mm. then very nicely will connect it mm. to the next panel. Oh, okay. Um, uh, basically, uh, we were asked in 2005 to look at the uh, uh, real estate situation of Citadel. Citadel, a kind of famous in, uh, hedge fund in Chicago, and it was very flattering to be asked as an architect. And their kind of problem was that they were growing completely like crazy and kind of distributed randomly in a skyscraper, so it became kind of very difficult to communicate the different components of the company. 
And also, uh, we discovered that kind of basically every single worker was surrounded by a kind of wall of computers, and therefore also unable to e capture any kind of vibe from any other kind of uh, different domain. So we were uh, we worked on a kind of very uh, sincere uh, and, in my view, kind of beautiful way in a new kind of desk where computers were almost embedded in the desk so that actually people could look across computers and could look each other in, in, in the face. And I also thought that ceilings uh, are always, are completely uh, ignored by architecture as a kind of form of communication. And what we kind of proposed to them is that there would be kind of bands in the ceiling where uh, news or important information or important connections between kind of some of the workers could be broadcast as a kind of permanent uh, uh, line of communication. Uh, but uh, of course the, the whole project didn't happen because Citadel then moved to a different building and then the growth uh, went on and on. And, and that is the kind of paradox that uh, architecture is compared to the uh, evolution of, of course, the digital world so incredibly slow that it's almost always coming behind. And that is where it is kind of really interesting that uh, Matthias Dupfner, who is the next speaker, uh, developed the ambition to create a building in uh, Berlin uh, for Springer, uh, where exactly the kind of digital part of the company, and that's a larger and larger kind of part, can feel accommodated, uh, can feel kind of respected, but can also work uh, together in spite of the many kind of divisions uh, in terms of uh, different companies can work together in a single place, which uh, particularly is kind of designed to promote and to actually enable the communication between the different uh, kind of com uh, compartments. Great. Now we can take two questions, urgent questions for Rem. No time. Can we take one question? Let's take one question. Is there a question for Rem? No question. Thank you all so Thank much. You. Thank you, Ryan.